Hi there. Today we're talking about Big Transfer General Visual Representation Learning by Alexander Koleshnikov, Lukas Bayer, Jawa Chai, and others of Google Brain. So this paper is basically an application slash engineering paper for the community. And it is about the task of transfer learning for visual tasks. So what does that mean? In a visual task, the meaning is basically that the input is an image. So it could be a classifier where you have an image and you have to say that this is a cat. Or it could be, let's say, a medical image of a lung and you have to point out where the defect in the lung is or, or if there is a defect in the lung or something like this. Uh, as we all know, this field is pretty much dominated by uh, CNNs, by convolutional neural networks that take in these images uh, through many layers of convolution, especially residual networks are doing particularly well on these tasks. The problem, of course, is that in, in, in some tasks, you have lots of data and that's fine because CNNs need lots of data to train. But in some tasks, especially these medical tasks, you only have like very small database. Look at this small database. <laughs> you, you only have very few labeled samples where the model could learn from. And that just is, is not enough to learn these big models that would perform well. So you will have to settle for a less performing model. Now the solution or one of the solutions is transfer learning. In transfer learning, what you do is you take a large data set, um, for example, the ImageNet data set, you have this big data set right here, and you train your CNN on that. And then you take that CNN and you do what's called a fine tuning step um, on this small data set. So you take the CNN that you gained from the large data set as a starting point, and then you just train for a few steps. You just kind of adapt it to this final data set that you actually want to train it on. And that usually helps. And why does that help? Because you sort of hope that the, the large data set and the small data set are at least somewhat overlapping in, um, in their, so the, the images in the large data set are somewhat similar to the images in the small data set. It doesn't need to be super similar, but just somewhat. And you hope that the features that the CNN learns from the large data set are useful in the small data set. Because then, if that is the case, when you fine tune on the small data set, that's this step down here, that's called fine tuning. When you fine tune, you can pretty much reuse those features. You only have to adjust them a little bit. You, and you just have to learn how to map the features to the output which now is of course different than in the original task, but you won't, won't have to rediscover the features. So that's why transfer learning can help. So the first phase is called pre-training. The second phase is called fine tuning. Now the ultimate goal in this is the following. Imagine you have like a giant database of data, right? This is giant. Look at the size comparison to the others. <laughs> And so you have this big, big database of images and you train a CNN on that big database of, of labeled images. Now, what you're hoping is that you can do this once and then this one CNN trained on the, this giant data set will become the starting point for all kinds of small tasks now. So basically you can post this on a repository online and everyone that has a visual task will not train from scratch, but they will basically take the this, this one CNN as a starting point. It is very similar to what people are doing right now with BERT um, or generally these transformer language models. You never want to train them from scratch. You always want to train from a pre-trained state that someone else has uh, done. Because usually the big work is now shifted to the pre-training. So the goal is to find this one universal uh, starting point for visual uh, learning. And of course, no better 
place to do this than Google. They certainly do have a giant databases of images. They certainly have lots of computation, which we're going to see is very necessary for something like this. Now they do train three different models. Their model is called BIT and they train three different variants BIT, small, medium and large. So the L model is trained on 300 million images. The medium model is trained on 14 million images. Uh, so this is the, I think it's called JFT dataset. This here is called the ImageNet 21K dataset, which looks pretty funky. Uh, it, it has like objects in front of weird backgrounds and stuff like that. And the small is simply trained on the 1.3 million image net uh, data set. Uh, so, I, I mean, just look at this. We're in a situation now where the small model is trained, is pre-trained on image net, just for reference. <laughs> if you had imagined this five years ago, this you would not have, maybe you would have guessed it, but it's still impressive. So. They do release these two models here, the medium and the small one, uh, pre-trained, I believe. They don't release the large one, which uh, maybe that's the price we have to pay uh, for getting the medium and the small one. The fact that now Google can use this in their products because they have probably spent a considerable amount of money in doing this. Uh, I'm not sure this is a philosophical discussion whether in the interest of science they should release all because they do give the the sort of exact training protocol you just need the money basically um all right but that's not topic of this video so the the models here are all pretty much just residual networks they're all um they're all these resnet uh 152 i think x4 which means that basically scale the width of each layer by a number of four from the original ResNet architecture. And that's pretty much it. They just, this is the architecture. There's nothing really new in this paper. It's the paper just details what exactly you have to do, which things exactly matter when you pre-train these things and uh, which ones don't. And for therefore, I believe it is a, it is a pretty good paper and I think that these models here, the M and S models, and maybe someone else trains an L model and releases it, will sort of become the standard like we have in BERT now. So whenever you have a visual task, you're just gonna start from those uh, in practice. So this, I think, is mainly relevant for people in practice. All right, uh, here you can see the these models First of all, excellent, excellent not labeling of your x-axis. Absolutely beautiful. Um, the x-axis, I believe, is the number of samples per data class. So now they take their pre-trained model, this bit L, and they fine tune it on these data sets. So ImageNet is one of the tasks they fine tune on, or CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, and so on. And First of all, look on the right side, this full thing. This is when you take the entire data set. So often they outperform, they get state of the art on the full data sets. Now they do compare against what they call generalist models. So generalist models are ones that have this particular training protocol where they train on one big giant um, database and then fine tune to all the other tasks. They do not achieve state of the art uh, on all data sets in what they call specialist models. The specialist models would be such models that have this exact task in mind and therefore they don't care about other tasks. They outperform some of the specialist models but not all of them. So this is not a this is not the new state of the art in everything, but it is in this transfer learning regime. And I think even more important if you see on the left, this is in the small label regime. So here you have something like 100 or 25 or 10 or even five labels per class. And if you take five labels per class for C for 10, this model, so of course you have to pre-train it first on the big data set, but just taking five labels per class, 
you still get like 94% accuracy on C410. And that's pretty good. Um, that is pretty impressive, especially if you compare it to this baseline model here, which is a ResNet pre-trained on just the ImageNet dataset. So that really shows you the power of pre-training with full data. Um, <clears throat> so one thing they say is that in their big data set, in their uh, 300 million images, they make sure to remove all the images that then appear in the downstream tasks, right? <laughs> because otherwise you, it, it is fairly conceivable that this database here is just scraped from the internet. And of course, these tasks are often, is like C410 are also scraped from the internet is, and also ImageNet. And um, it is entirely conceivable, of course, that the test data is already here. Uh, and they say we remove images, but I think they just remove exact duplicates. So it could still be that, you know, someone has taken ImageNet and then kind of recoded it into another color scheme or whatnot, or just compressed it a bit more. And, um, and then they find these images on the web. So it's a little shaky, this whole thing, because these data sets might just be part of one another. But, you know, given the results, I do generally believe the improvements here. But <laughs> yeah. So I guess what we would need is like people to actually go out with cameras and shoot new pictures for a new test set. But in any case, let's dive into how to pre-train something like this. So they divide their findings up in two parts, how to pre-train and how to fine tune. So how to transfer to down, downstream tasks and the methods they find are surprisingly easy. So they say there's two components to pre-training. The first component is scale. So you have to have a lot of data and a lot of models. And that is a pretty important recognition. So down here, they have this ablation where they scale up the model and scale up the data. So look at this, for example, you can see here, you have the different data sets to pre train on. So this is the small data set, the medium data set and the large data set. So in this direction, you have data set size. Then here you have accuracy not labeled. Again, I guess we can understand accuracy. That's fine. Um, I'm nitpicky now. And there we have the different models. Now, the larger the dot here is, the larger the model architecture. And you can see within the individual bins, the larger the model, the better performance you usually get. But as you can see, like here, this improvement in the large models isn't as much as when you have much data. And you can also see by the slope of the line here, the larger amounts of data help more when you have larger models. So only scaling up the um, only scaling up the mod, the, the data is not as effective as scaling up the data and model at the same time. And in some cases, like in this small architecture here, it actually hurts to incorporate more data. At least they say that. And you can also see that here and here, it just doesn't help as much anymore if you incorporate more data. So if your model is too small, you can't handle the big data. Of course, there are weird effects like here, the performance goes down and then up with the larger data. So this might actually be an effect of the images in these data sets being somewhat qualitatively different. Um, also with respect to the task that you are uh, training for, but in general, it holds that you need a combination of data set size and model size to go up. And this, I think, might be an indication of where we are in Belkin's double descent curve. So if you look at, uh, there's the researcher Mikhail Belkin and others, people also research in this area, they have this sort of empirical finding and, and uh, hypothesis sort of that if you plot a graph and here is the number of parameters 
in relation to the data set size. Right? So number of parameters in relation to, to size of data. Um, and here is your validation loss. Then what happens as you have very little parameters, you can add more parameters to your model to get better validation loss, right? This is, you know, we get a better model um, and we train that and we get better. And then at some point, you'll start to overfit. You know, we've all learned this in our general machine learning course. And there is a point here, the what, what is called the interpolation threshold, where you have, this is one. So the number of parameters is equal to the number of data points, which is just interpolating your training data. Sorry, the data point here, that's train. But then the discovery sort of is that this comes down again and it stays down. So as you go up in number of data points, uh, sorry, number of parameters with the same data set, you're perfectly fitting the training data set. You're past the number of data points in your, in, in your model, but still your validation loss comes down and there's various hypotheses why this uh, could happen. And here, we find ourselves maybe in this sort of, of situation where if you have a model right here uh, and you want to scale it, you want to add more data, you can't just keep the model constant because if you add more data, that will shift you to the left here because you add more data, but you keep the, mo the number of parameters the same. So this number will shift to the left and you actually go up in your validation loss. So maybe this is actually what's happening right here. Um, the fact that the model is too small. This is just a hypothesis by me. Um, so if you want to up your number of data points, you also have to up your number of parameters and that will keep it going and maybe these models here are more on this side of this interpolation threshold and the models where it doesn't happen might be more over here though that is a, a big thing to assume um maybe not <laughs> now that i think about it since they have even more parameters here they would be even more here somewhere so maybe you add a bunch of data, it's just not as bad. There might be some weird interactions here. It might be like this. Who knows? Let's just skip this. <laughs> In any case, um, the, the message here is you need more model and more data at the same time. All right. Then there is a second message, a second recipe for pre-training. Uh, there we are. The second method is group normalization and weight standardization. So they criticize batch norm. Batch norm has of course been used a lot. Um, that is where if you have a batch of data uh, da, 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 and you put it, so these are all data points, you put it through your layers and it has some intermediate representation what you want to do is you want to calculate sort of the mean and variance of your data in each of the features and then make it such that it's nice mean one and standard deviation so mean zero and standard deviation of one that is called batch norm but of course it is dependent on your batch size so it is dependent on how many data points you have because that's how well you can estimate these mean and uh, variance parameters. And what people do nowadays is they take these batches and they group them into different groups and they distribute those groups onto many, many machines, um, which is called data parallelism, especially with TPUs nowadays. You can just distribute everything to so many TPUs, I believe they say they distribute to something like 500 TPUs, which, and so they have a batch size of, I think 4,000 and they distribute to 500 TPUs. So that leaves them with eight, uh, eight samples per batch. So this is eight and eight is just not very good for batch norm. And if you have to, if you want to circumvent that you need to 
in each layer globally sync with all of the other workers your batch norm parameters and that slows you down so people have uh, gone around this using what they call group normalization and weight standardization so these two techniques of weight standardization is a is a addition to group normalization they don't require the, the other samples in the batch they work on a per sample basis and they normalize the features within uh, groups of each channel so the the group normalization groups together different features within a sample and then uh, normalizes across that and the weight standardization is a bit like standardizing the features but it standardizes the weights to be of a normal distribution and just suffice to say these are standard techniques that you can build in and they allow you to not have to synchronize constantly between your workers at the training time which makes everything a lot faster and also not a problem that you just have eight samples per worker all right so that's what they do they do large data large models and group normalization with weight standardization that's how they pre-train and then how do they fine-tune they say they have a rule to select hyperparameters they call the bit hyper rule and that's just sort of a formula um, of how you have one hyperparameter so you have one I guess it's a hyper hyper parameter and that hyper hyper parameter you run through their rule and the rule will tell you what each of the hyper parameters should be so it's it's maybe it's like a lookup table basically it's it's oh you set this one number and we give you the rest of the hyper parameters and that one rule works pretty well so you only have to find for fine tuning you only have to s grid search over one hyperparameter. It's not really a grid anymore, is it? <laughs> and then they basically decide on the um, training schedule length, resolution, and whether to do mix up regularization. Mix up is a technique that can help when you have very little data and um, it what it does is it interpolates between data points and also trains on kind of like data points from half this class and half that class uh, just to make more data available uh, but they all have this packed into this rule and they of course the exact settings of this rule are presented so you can look it up then they have a, a data pre-processing resize the image to a square crop out smaller random square randomly horizontally flip the image at training time so they basically describe a standard training protocol here don't want to go mix it uh, too up up too much the only thing they say is surprisingly we do not use any form any of the following forms of regularization during downstream tuning weight decay to zero weight decay to initial parameters or dropout uh, I think they only use weight decay during pre-training and that's it so let's look at some of the graphs we've already seen some uh, here is where they pretty much outperform the generalist these generalist models on all of these tasks uh, including this visual task adaptation benchmark I've made a video about this this is a benchmark that includes 19 different visual tasks from all over the place and uh, they have significant improvement here as you can see they do not always outperform these specialist uh, models but as you can see they outperform for example this on the flowers data set and they come pretty close and here you can also see how much they improve uh, when pre-training on a larger data set so so far people have basically pre-trained on this ImageNet data set and uh, now that they pre-train on the larger one of course they gain a lot of performance and the largest one isn't even in this in this table so what I finally want to look at is this visual task adaptation benchmark this 
um, consists of 19 tasks and they're divided into natural tasks, which are kind of natural images, and then specialized tasks, which are, let's say, the medical images, so not really natural, and then structured tasks. And the structured tasks isn't simply labeling or locating something, it is task where you have to maybe reason about something. So let's say uh, there is an image and there is a cup right here and there is a glass right here and the question is what's to the left of the glass and you know, there's other bunch of other stuff around here and you have to say the cup. So it sort of requires a structured understanding of the image. And you can see the main performance boost here comes in the natural images, which is to be expected. So uh, you only get what you feed in. And this 300 million image data set, I'm pretty sure that's just a web scrape of photos or mainly photos. So the main improvement you're gonna get is on pictures that are similar to that, as we said at the beginning. And these natural tasks have images like that. And you can see that the model here improves extremely in that category, improves slightly in this specialized thing, and only improves a little bit in the structured tasks. Um, so this, as I said, is, is to be expected. Uh, just know if you use this model, know what is in there. You have to know what it does, what it does well. It does well on natural images that are similar to what it was pre-trained on. Okay, so they do have some analysis here and we've already uh, went to most of them. I find this to be pretty, pretty impressive. So they say, when they apply the standard computational budget of ImageNet pre-training, uh, when they scale up to the larger data set, it seems detrimental. As you can see right here, the performance actually goes down when you go to the larger data set. Only if you train longer, then you improves. <laughs> the axis labeling is just amazing here. Standard, long, longer. Oh, <laughs> how long you train for? Longer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but I guess the point is taken that the the, you have to invest more computation along with your bigger model and bigger data set. Sorry, it's the same model, but the bigger data set. Um, and they also make some other points here that if you, for example, if you decrease your learning rate too early or set your weight decay parameter different uh, wrongly, that also hurts you. So on the right here, you see a smaller weight decay initially looks better. So initially you're higher, but um, through the training, you end up at a worse place than a higher setting right here. And I mean, they, they make a big point out of this, but who's to say that someone else doesn't come with like a 10 times longer training and figures out that uh, ultimately you start off like this and then maybe goes up super high. So to me, this, this, the, the lessons learned here is pretty much that there's always a way to get uh, more performance out of more compute and probably there is a way to schedule all of these things because that's combined with decaying learning rate and so on. There's probably a way to schedule these things with the current, re with, with this particular method that would end up somewhere here. We just haven't found it yet because it's so complex. I, I would guess that is the, the, the case. Here they make an interesting point that if you decay the learning rate too early, then you also end up at a worse place. So this, this dashed researcher here, the haha, <laughs> the noob. Um, so after eight GPU weeks, which come on, what is that? Eight GPU weeks, that's just eight GPUs for a week. I mean, that's nothing, nothing. Um, it looks like this, right? It looks fairly flat. And this researcher now decides to decay the learning rate and that results in this thing here. So decays the learning rate here, here, and here. Um, sorry, not, not here. 
So it decays the learning rate here and then it flattens out again and then decays the learning rate again. Ends up at this level. Yet if you train for longer, you can see right here, if you look over eight months, you can see that there is a slight upward trend still and it hasn't converged yet. And you can, in dec if you decrease the learning rate only later and always wait for this to fully converge, then you will end up at a better place right here above 70. Again, who's to say that if I just wait here, there isn't a slight upward trend. If I wait for eight GPU uh, years or eight GPU uh, solar system births, then there might be even a better point to decay, finally decay the learning rate and then go up. I mean, again, this this researcher here only takes 0.5 million steps where you take 2 million. So that's the first point. The second point is uh, ImageNet or visual state-of-the-art research is now officially out of the hands of academia. Uh, this, this is it. If you see things like, if you see a paper dissing on people that only wait eight GPU weeks to decrease their learning rate at, for the first time, and advocating that you should, you know, at least wait until eight GPU months. Actually, they wait twice as long. Uh, it's over. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Maybe, maybe, you know, you want to do some theory or something. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. What I find interesting is the mistakes. So since on CIFAR 10, they reach like 99.4%, there's only a handful of mistakes that they're still making because it's not that large of a data set. And they do classify it. So red in particular, I think, uh, means red is the ground truth label is correct. But green is the machine is correct and the ground truth label is wrong. And you can see there is a fair number of green things here, right? So um, the model says ship and the label says cat and the model says bird and the label says cat. Clearly this, I mean, this, this would be one weird cat. Um, so it, it gets to the point where you, you also have to expect these errors to be in the training set. So it could just be that the model here doesn't necessarily even make those mistakes, but it's just somewhat consistent with the training set in making the mistakes. And also here on ImageNet, they have selected ones where, you know, the model says notebook, but it's actually laptop. And the model says mouse, but it's actually space bar. Um, you know, the model says Alp and it's ski. So, um, or here the model, the model says candle but it's a, this is a dishwasher. <laughs> what? Um, so you, you see that the, the, the types of mistakes here, we get to very quirky, very fine grained points in these models. Uh, last thing I want to show, I have never seen these ImageNet 21K images. These are just funky. Like, look at that. So here's the, the the state of the art previously, I think, said Triceratops. And the new model now says, bit L says starfish. Uh, good job, bit L. You've, <laughs> wow. Uh, probably the correct label would just be weird. And this, no. Okay, uh, I don't want to rag on this too much. Uh, this is a cool paper. I believe this will be the new starting point for a lot of practitioners in uh, when they do visual tasks. I always, as always, invite you to check out the paper, uh, subscribe to the channel, leave a like, leave a comment if you want. I do read them usually and bye-bye.